All right, so as we get started today, we're gonna do a little exercise, and it's gonna be pretty simple. You just kinda have to share your emotions based on some scenarios, some situations, some experiences that we're gonna show on the screen that maybe you've experienced before, or you can at least put yourself into that situation and kinda pretend that's probably how I'd be feeling. All right, so let's go with the first option here. You win a close-fought sports game, what would you be feeling emotionally after, after an experience like this? A lot of woo-hoos, yays, anything else? <laughs> uh, I'm gonna ask another question, you don't have to shout this one out, but if you had an opportunity to have just a short, silent prayer to God after a moment like this, what would you tell God? What would you speak to God? Just think about it, you have your answer. We'll move on. All right, next scenario. Go and shout out an answer to this one, but you're given work project at the end of the work day, which has to be finished before you leave. How would you be feeling? Go ahead and shout out your answer. Frustration. I almost was done. I got some booze here. Any other emotions? The first service, there was someone who was like, I'm going to strangle my boss. I, I think that's an emotion plus an action, but uh, all right, what would you, what would you pray? In this moment, if you had that silent opportunity to pray, what would you talk to God about in that moment? Just kind of answer in your own mind. All right, next scenario. You find your missing car keys. Always good, always good. Emotionally, emotionally be feeling good. Any other thoughts? <laughs> A lot of yes. all right. Now, in that moment, if you could say something to God, what would you tell God? <laughs> Thank you, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, next scenario. <clears throat> okay, the doctors tell you that they have to run some more tests because, well, they're unsure what's going on inside your body. What would you, where are you at emotionally in that? Okay, there's some booze. <laughs> How about the prayer? How about the prayer? What would you say to God? What would you communicate to God in that moment? All right, next one, next one. Okay, you hit your goal weight after working toward it for eight months. How would you be feeling? Finally. finally, yes, it's arrived. Feeling pretty good about yourself? Like, yeah, I worked hard, I'm finally here, yeah, yeah. Okay, in that moment, if you could have that time of prayer with God, what would you communicate to him about this situation? All right, we've got one more. You're in an argument that ends with the other person storming out and slamming a door where are you at emotionally? What are your feelings? Troubled? Angry? <laughs> Tony, Tony knows that's a sound. That slamming door is a sound of victory for him. It's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, in, in your prayer, what would you be communicating to God in a moment like that, though? What would you say to him? What would you ask? What would you speak into your own heart and your life at that point? All right, so uh, there's a couple of reasons why we did this exercise. Um, and the first one is just to highlight the fact that we know that in life, we're going to receive some, some experiences that are going to feel a lot like gifts, aren't we? I mean, when you find your car keys and you've been looking for your car keys for like 30 minutes, you know that it's just like a sweet gift. When you work hard towards a goal, whether it's to win a, hot, uh, a closely fought a sports game, or it's to get to that goal weight, there's a sense of accomplishment. It's like, this is such a gift. On the other hand, we know that, um, and, and actually just to back up on that, we see in scripture that gifts, like good gifts, according to James chapter one, every good and pleasing gift comes from who? From God, from God. And so in that moment of a good gift, it's like, hey, thank you, God. Thank you, God, so much for this wonderful gift. Hopefully that, that heart of generosity flows out of us. At the same time, though, we know that we're going to experience some difficulties. We're going to experience some storms. We're going to have moments of maybe depression and anxiety. We're going to even have moments of great desperation. But what I want to share with you is that maybe those are gifts as well. They're gifts we don't want. They're gifts that we would certainly like to pass off. But maybe they're gifts that we actually need even though we don't want them. As you look at scripture, one of the things that you see throughout scripture is that God allows individuals to go through seasons of difficulty, allows them to go through times of desperation, 
And it's through the desperation that they seek God with a level of intensity that they otherwise would not have sought God with, and they actually experience and they find God in ways that they otherwise would not have experienced and found him in. And even if you ask those individuals, I think most of them would say, yeah, I didn't want that gift, but it was a gift that I actually needed. And I know hearing your stories and talking with a number of you, this isn't just something that we see in scripture. This is your testimony. Your testimony is that you went through a storm. You went through multiple storms in life, and it was the storms that actually brought you to God in the first place. It was that humbling experience of on your knees, I surrender to you, I don't have the answers. And it was in that that you actually received the gift of Christ and his grace in the first place. It was a gift that you didn't really want, the difficulty, the pain, the storm, but it was actually a gift that you needed. In my life, there's been a few of these experiences One uh, that comes to my mind is one that my wife Dana shared through a video testimony a number of years ago, and since a number of you are new and some of you just don't have very good memories, I thought I could share it again and it'd be fairly new. Um, But it's a story that takes place when we were doing ministry in Swaziland. It's a small country in southern Africa. It's now called Eswatini. And this was just a few months, maybe about six months before our son Owen is going to be born. So this is our first child, very first child. There's already a level of anxiety, like, okay, you know, is, the, is this, the birthing process going to go smoothly? We've never done this before. And then to make matters worse, we're like, we're in a foreign country. What do we need to do? And everybody was encouraging us to have the baby in South Africa. They were encouraging us to do that because not knowing how that birthing process would go, it's like, hey, better be in South Africa where they have the medical teams in place to actually deal with those complications than be in Swaziland and find yourself in a situation where you know, your child's at risk, the, the mom's at risk, and they don't have the means to uh, like, you know, keep, keep either one alive. And so we were torn because on one hand, um, that made sense, but on the other hand, we, we did not like going to South Africa so much. Not that South Africa is bad, it's just there's a high crime rate in South Africa. And it seemed like every single time, mm, let me back up on that, it seemed like every other time, every other time that we went to South Africa, we were a victim of of crime. Uh, No kidding, like we would go to South Africa and our car would get stolen, never never to be seen again, kind of annoying. We would go to South Africa and I actually experienced being physically assaulted, Not, not the best feeling, right? Go to South Africa and we're robbed. Even the individuals who are supposed to protect you, the police officers, we experience extortion from them. Pay the bribe or we're gonna take you to jail. And it's like, oh my goodness, no, we don't wanna spend more time in South Africa. We just don't feel safe as a family going to South Africa. And so there's this tension, this, this stress. It's like, okay, our baby's coming. What is the best thing we can do for our baby? Is it to have the child here in South Africa or uh, in Swaziland where he might be at risk, where, where she might be at risk? But then if we go to South Africa, it's like, we all might be at risk. Like, what do we do? What do we do? And so as a you know, a husband who wants to spiritually lead uh, the family, I decided, honey, you make the decision. Like, you, <laughs> it's, your, it's your call. You're having the baby, so I'm going to let you lead on this one. And, and that, may, that may not have been the best strategy, but this caused a ton of, of stress on my wife. And it was worse because, you know, she's reading all the, all the books on the babies and like, okay, what to expect when you're expecting and all that other stuff. And what is she reading? She's reading that stress is not a good thing for the baby. Like that's a part of like, you know, the development. So now she's stressed about being stressed and it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And it was in this moment of anxiety that she actually experiences what is really our theme verse for this series that we're in called Seek, Reach, and Find. We see that God, um, in Acts chapter 17, uh, what we see is a unique Um, aspect of how God interacts with humanity. And I want to just read our theme verses. We're going to, again, read these in context in just a couple of weeks. But in verse 26, we read that from one man he made, God made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. So he's created human beings, and he's placed them at certain times in certain locations. He might actually have placed you at certain times and certain locations so that you'll have certain experiences. Why? Well, verse 27 explains. God did this. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. And so what does Dana do in this desperate moment? 
What do I do for our family? What do I do for my child? Well, she does what this verse indicates. She seeks the Lord. She reaches out for the Lord in prayer. And she experiences, probably for the first time at this point in her life, the promise of Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 that says, hey, guys, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, like bring your prayers, bring your petitions to God. And what is the promise of that? The peace, the peace of God will actually enter our hearts, and it won't even make sense. And for the very first time, um, at least to this level, the, the peace of God, as she sought the Lord, just entered her heart and her mind. And I remember just having these conversations with her, and, and it was like night and day. Like, I, I was dealing with a completely different woman who was so wrapped up in fear that I was like, let's just, let's just leave for the United States, and let's just like go back home to, you know what, let's have the ba- baby here in Swaziland. I trust the Lord. I trust the Lord is going to see us through this, and certainly that's what happened. We had Owen. Uh, he was a healthy baby boy, and he's still, he's still pretty healthy and pretty, still pretty cool, even though it was like 15 years ago, right? Um, but what we're talking about today is we're talking about how oftentimes we're given these gifts, that don't appear like gifts. They appear like storms. They, they appear like struggles. They, they appear as desperate moments in life. But they're actually potentially gifts, gifts that cause us to seek, cause us to reach, so that we can find and experience God in unique ways. Today, with the rest of our time, we're going to be looking at two uh, individuals who this is certainly their story. They didn't want this gift of desperation, but that's what God gave them. And it's because of this gift that they actually encountered Jesus in their lives. If you would, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. We're going to start reading in verse 40. Luke chapter 8, verse 40 begins. Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. A little bit of context on this verse. Uh, Jesus has returned from traveling uh, fr- to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. We've got a map just to kind of give you some uh, picture of where Jesus is at. He is currently in this region called Galilee, most likely Capernaum. And what he, if you read earlier in the chapter, he actually sails with his disciples to the other side, to the east side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Greek-speaking pagan uh, don't go there unless you have to go there because it's the hood side of the Sea of Galilee, right? You ever enter those neighborhoods? You're like, oh, if I have to, but that's like the only place with that store. And so I'm going to, and you know, you're going to get mugged. Like, you know, it's a sketchy place, but you go there anyway. And so he goes over there and sure enough, like if you read the, the, the chapter or that earlier in the chapter, like he goes over there and there's a demon possessed man who's demon possessed by legions of, of demons. And then there's just like this casting out of the demons, and they get in the pigs. It gets really weird, and it's like, no wonder, because you need to just stay on the Jewish side of the Sea of Galilee, and things like that just don't happen. So they return, and when they return, everybody's just excited. They're like, okay, you made it. Whew, thank goodness, you made it. It's sketchy over there, and they're excited to see him, and they're excited to hear the stories that he has to tell. That's where we're at. Verse 41 continues, though. It says, then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet pleading with him to come to his house. Why? Because he has a daughter, his only daughter, who's 12. And what's her situation in life? She's dying. She's dying. So what is this? This is every parent's worst nightmare. What is this space? This is every father's most dreaded experience, trying to help, trying to to take care of his family, and yet, his daughter, his only daughter, is dying. Now, what's unique is in a sea of potentially hundreds of faces, like no names are mentioned except for this individual, Jairus. Why? Because he's actually well-known. He's well-known because he's a synagogue leader. What would a synagogue leader be? This would be the equivalent of maybe a pastor, priest, and a mayor all rolled up into one well-known individual. In fact, he's so well-known, everybody knows that if they've got problems, if they've got issues, they, well, they go to Jairus for their answers. And where do we see Jesus? Well, we see that Jairus is at his feet asking for answers. Jairus is the one that everybody goes to when they want to know a little bit more about God because he's the one that's like connected to God a little bit deeper. And so everyone goes to him, yet, yet he's the one at Jesus' feet. And so you may be wondering, like, what, I mean, what, what, 
What's he going to be thinking about? His reputation. I mean, he's like groveling at the feet of Jesus, and quite possibly, quite possibly knowing what we know about Jesus' relationship with other religious leaders, Jairus might have been one of those guys who's like, just by the way, like maybe just a few weeks earlier, by the way, he's not a real rabbi, okay? Jesus, like he's not a real trained teacher like I am. So listen to him, but like if it gets weird, like come back to me and I'll say, it could have been one of these things, but what is he doing? He is falling at the feet of Jesus and he's looking for answers. Does he care about the crowds at this point? No, the level of desperation has gotten to the point where his pride, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. This is a good place to be. At the feet of Jesus, seeking with all your heart, with great intensity, but it's a hard place to get. It's a good place to be, but it's a hard place to get. Oftentimes, it's because we are worried about the crowd. We're afraid of the people around us. I think there are probably some of you that you've been a part of our church, and maybe the last few weeks, there's been a sense where God just kind of put some things on your heart, maybe asked you to repent from certain uh, you know, sin patterns that are in your life, and you're like, mm-mm, mm-mm, I, I just... I, I can confess those sins to you. I can say, God, I'm sorry. Yeah, I messed up again. But I don't want to confess that to other people because you're worried about the crowd. You, do, you don't want to confess it to other people, but God's saying, actually, for you to actually experience real repentance, you need accountability. And in order to, to actually have real accountability, you're going to have to share this with a brother or sister in Christ who's trusting you. Like, no, 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 I don't know what the, they're going to think less of me. I don't, and you're afraid of the crowd. Others of you, maybe... Maybe you're just afraid of joining our church. We get those, the invitation, like, hey, come forward. Go on mission with us as a church. And you're like, nah, I'm afraid of the crowd. Not this crowd, because this crowd would be really excited for you. You'd be like, yeah, good to have you part of the family. But you're afraid of the crowd back home. You're, you're afraid of what your spouse might think, because your spouse is already saying, I don't really like you going to church. I don't really get it. I, I, I don't trust you know, church members. and I, They're always after your money. And, and what is that going to mean if you have to go, hey, I'm a member of the church now. I, I don't want to deal with this. Others of you, you might have been a part of our church for years now, and everyone kind of just assumes you're a baptized believer in Christ, and yet you've never given your life to Christ in baptism. But it's too late now for it not to be weird. Like, if you come forward, I was like, what? I thought, eh. you know, it's weird. I, I'm afraid of the crowd. Meanwhile, you've got a crowd that would just be so excited if you came forward. It wouldn't be weird at all. But what do we do? We, we get afraid of the crowd. It's a good place to be at the feet of Jesus, but it's a hard place to oftentimes get. And so the question I want to ask you is, at what point does your level of desperation actually outpace your pride? And the truth is, for some people, it never happens. It never happens. There are some people, and you probably know some of these people, that they would rather drown than tell you that they can't swim. Like, there are some people that are just like, what are you doing over there? you need some help? No, 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 I got this. Really? Because it doesn't even look like you're doggy paddling there. I'm just trying to practice holding my breath. That's what I'm doing. Really? Is that what I... Five minutes later, should we help him? He said he had it. Like, there are some people. There are some people who would rather be crushed by the weight of life than to ask for a spotter. You know those folks? Like, you hear the muscles tearing. Like, you hear the bones cracking, and you go to reach for the bar, and they're like, ah, don't touch that bar. I got this. No, no, no. Okay, all right, you can be crushed. I, I was willing to help. There are some individuals who are comfortable with going in the wrong direction for hours, for days, decades, rather than admit that they have no idea where they're going. They're too prideful to realize, hey, I need, I need help. I have no direction in my life. I need, some, I need some direction. When will the level of our desperation get to the point where it overrides our pride? Let's continue. Jairus is there. He's gotten to that point. He's going to seek. He's going to reach for Jesus for these answers. Right in the middle of verse um, 42. As Jesus was on his way. So where is he on his way to? He's on his way to Jairus' house now. He's going to hopefully minister to this little girl. As Jesus was on his way, the crowd almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. But no one could heal her. Let's just compare these two individuals that we're introduced to. We've got Jairus, everybody knows his name. He's a synagogue leader. And now we've got this woman who's not even given a name. Her situation, she's been subject to bleeding for 12 long years. That means that she's been considered unclean for 12 years. She would like to go and and serve and, and, and worship in the synagogue, but she's not able to. Meanwhile, we've got a leader of the synagogue right there. And and this is going on for 12 years? 
I mean, we know that we're going to deal with some issues over the course of 12 years, but what about when it's the same issue day in and day out? That's a whole other level of desperation, isn't it? And we know we're going to have some issues in our marriage, but what happens when it's the same issue day in and day out? Another level of desperation, isn't it? Like we, we have the understanding that we're going to have some issues at school, we're going to have some issues with our coworkers, but what, is it, what happens when it's the same issue over and over again? Another level of desperation. That's where she's at. All right, what I'd like you to do now is just kind of keep your bookmark or your finger in Luke chapter 8, but what I want to do is I want to move over to Mark chapter 5, because Mark also records this account, but he includes some information that just kind of expands where this woman is truly at. So if you would, keep your place here in Luke 8, and then head over to Mark chapter 5. We're going to pick the story up in verse 26. So he's on his way, and there's this woman, right? Verse 26 explains what her situation is. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors. Many doctors. Now, for those of you who are students of Scripture, you're probably thinking to yourself, I know why Luke left that out of his gospel account. Because Luke is a, and he's like, I, I'm just going to, I'm just going to say nobody could heal her, right? I'm just, I'm going to say they gave it their good old college try, but I don't want to like encourage malpractice lawsuits. So, you know, they, they tried, but many, many doctors tried to help her. It expands. What else? And had spent, what did she do? She had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. You ever had one of these moments in life? where someone makes some promises, uh, maybe someone encourages you to do this or that, and you are hopeful, you might even spend money towards it, and instead of getting better, you actually get worse? Ah, desperation, such a desperate situation. We, we know that in the Talmud, uh, there were 11 potential remedies that are given for this woman's situation. You can almost guarantee that she tried all 11 and with great hope and, and maybe some uh, intrepidation going in like, maybe, maybe this is the answer. And then every single time, you're just getting let down. Ever been there? You, you had high hopes. You prayed with great faith. And then just like, you just kept getting disappointed. Yet, this woman continues to seek. She continues to reach. And she's seeking and reaching now in the right place. What do we read in verse 28? It says, if I just touch his clothes... I will be healed. Guys, who, she's ta- who is she talking to? She's talking to herself. She's talking to herself. She, she's telling herself. She's, she, she's committing this, this narrative to her, herself, saying, if I, can, if I can just continue to seek, if I can just continue to, to, to reach, maybe, maybe Jesus has the answers here. And I don't want to just breeze on past this one because I think there's a principle in here that is certainly true of her. And I think you've probably seen it even true in your own life that oftentimes the stories that we tell ourselves in our desperate moments really are connected to with what we ultimately receive. There, there's something about the stories that we tell ourselves about who God is, the stories that we tell ourselves in our desperate moments about who God still is and who our identity is in Christ that will ultimately lead us to what we ultimately receive. Like this woman, she's speaking faith into her heart. If I can seek, if I can reach, and this opens up the opportunity for the healing to take place. But unfortunately, I think sometimes when we're in the, our storms, when we're in our depression, when we're in our anxiety, the stories that we tell ourselves are less than helpful. You ever been there? It, it's that narrative that just keeps rolling back and forth and it's like, I, I'm never going to change. Like the di- addiction is just, it's got its hooks in me and it's never going to get any better and I just, I'm a complete failure. My marriage, my marriage is in shambles and I don't think it's ever going to be healed like my spouse, their heart is just too hard. There's never going to be reconciliation. We, we tell our story, and the story is, you know, my, my body, it's broken, and I'm old, and it's just, it's never, I don't care what the doctors say. My finances are a wreck. I'm never going to get out of debt. And we just have these negative narratives that we just keep swirling around in our minds. As I think maybe what some of us need to do is just take her example and begin once again speaking faith back into our hearts, reminding ourselves of God's narrative for us, that we are his children, loved children. 
We, we actually serve Jesus who says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And this isn't just a stand in front of the mirror and like flex and get all pumped and be like, yeah, you are smart enough. You are good enough. You are good looking enough. You go get them, tiger. Like that's not, that's not the pep talk that we're talking about here. This is, this is being real about who you are, but at the same time being real about who God is and what God can do in spite of you. And I, in my own life, there are times where I allow the, the negative narratives just to swirl around, the negative chatter way too much. Like when I'm discouraged, like it just, it, it doesn't want to shut off. But it's in those moments where I have to take a step back and I have to ask myself, wait, is this narrative from God or not? Like is, is the story that I'm telling about myself, is this actually from God? Because if it's not, I've got to let it go. And I need to re- begin to remind myself of who I am in Christ. This is a constant conversation that I even have with my kids. You know, they'll, they'll hear some things. And people, people will, will speak some things into their lives. And it's like, okay, let, let's talk about that. There may be some truth in what you're hearing, but is that narrative ultimately from God? Because if it's not, you need to let it go. And you need to remind yourself of who you are in Christ. You are loved. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit who can actually allow you to, to take on great challenges in life. Don't, don't, don't allow what they're saying to limit what God can do in and through you. And some of you, I think, just need to, to step back into that space as well. If you would, let's go ahead and head back to Luke. Luke chapter 8, we're going to pick the story up again in verse 44. <clears throat> she, this woman who's been bleeding, She came up behind him, came up behind Jesus, and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touch me. I know that power has gone out of me. So they're on their way to Jairus' house. You can imagine that Jairus is the one that is leading the charge, and he's probably got a very quick pace and all the crowd is slowing it down, and now he's looking and he's thinking, what is happening right now? Seriously, you're going to argue about this? Like, this is not something that's worth arguing. Let's go, let's go. Right? Can't you hear him, like, silently screaming, let's go? Come on. He's desperate. Verse 47, then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Two things I want to point out here. Um, Number one, when you're Jairus, and you've been waiting and waiting, and you've got a desperate moment, isn't it true that it's really frustrating when Jesus is not on your timetable? Like You're like, let's go, let's go, let's go. But what does Jesus, what does Jesus do? I don't know if you caught it, but I love the fact that Jesus stops and he calls this woman daughter. Don't you? We don't know her name. And if you know anything about the Gospels, uh, Jesus doesn't do this very often. Like, this is one of the few times that he actually identifies, communicates daughter to someone. And I think Jairus, in this desperate moment, as he's like, hey, get on my timetable, I think when he hears that word daughter, maybe he understands a little bit more than you and I do right now. He understands because he's got a 12-year-old girl at home, his daughter, who is suffering and is dying. And so he gets this. But Jesus has a woman who's been suffering for 12 years. And he wants to take the time to stop, to look her in the eye, and remind her that he sees her as daughter. So he continues. He continues over to Jairus' home. Um, well, let me read verse, uh, uh, verse 50, right in the middle of there, um, or verse 49. It says, while Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house and, uh, of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. So this is just immense agony and pain. Now, can you imagine being that father? You thought you were almost there, and now... Now the message has been delivered. It's too late. Like, send him, send him on his way. Like, immense agony, an immense pain, but before he's able to collapse on the ground, before he throws his hands up and screams and shouts, Jesus, Jesus speaks these words. Don't be afraid. Just believe, and she will be healed. Just believe. So, hey, your daughter's dead. Don't listen to that guy. 
Don't listen to them. Just keep believing. Keep believing. Your, your daughter's going to be okay. They head to the house. They enter the house. The, the daughter is dead. Verse 45. Excuse me, 55. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. I don't know if you can picture the scene, but you know this, this dead girl is laying on some sort of bed, and everybody is thinking, there's probably not much that can be done, but you can imagine that Jairus, you can imagine that Jairus' wife, you can imagine that all those who really love this girl, there's that seed of hope. There's that, but maybe, but maybe, but maybe. What are they doing? They're seeking. They're reaching. They're hoping. And what does Jesus do? He takes her by the hand and says, get up, my child. And then he looks around and he says, is that, is that a bowl of uh, Doritos? Yeah, get those Doritos over here. This girl needs a snack, right? Yeah. Let's heat up some Hot Pockets. She needs to start a challenge. No? Okay, well, that's where my mind goes. And then notice what happens. Verse 56. Her parents were astonished. Of course they were astonished. You know why her parents were astonished? They were astonished because they were in their most desperate space. And Jesus steps in in a miraculous way, and he says, I'm going to give you a gift. Like, you didn't want this gift here, but I'm going to give you a gift, and it's this gift of healing. See, so often in our lives, we don't want to go through desperate times. We don't want to go through desperate seasons. We don't want to go through pain. We want to avoid pain at all costs. And I think sometimes God's just whispering, it's a gift. It's a gift that is actually causing you to seek me. It's a gift that's causing you to reach, and you can find me. Why? We read it in Acts. Because he's not far. He's not far from any of us. And so I want to share two challenges with you today. And I think these two challenges are for probably two different people. Uh, there might be some overlap, but I think the, for the most part, they're for two different people. The first is a challenge for those of you who are going through a season of great difficulty. Like you're going through a storm. And, and what I want to encourage and I want to challenge you to do is going to sound really, really insensitive. But I'm going to share it all the same. I want to encourage you, even if you're challenge, your discouragement has been going for 12 plus years, I want to encourage you to begin seeing it as a gift. But John, you don't know my pain. Like, you don't know how long I've been struggling with this. You don't know I've tried everything. I want to encourage you to begin seeing it as a potential gift to cause you to seek the Lord with a, a new level of desperation. Because sometimes there's a gift in that desperation. And my hope and my prayer the hope and prayer that I have for you is that the, the gift will be a, a miraculous healing. My hope is that if it's a health thing, that you'll be miraculously healed. If it's a, an addiction thing, you'll be miraculously never need to touch that bottle again. If it's a relational thing, that it will all automatically, like reconciliation will be perfect and you guys will, will live well and it, yeah, you'll have your struggles, but you're committed to each other. That's my hope, that's my prayer. Now I think Jesus has the power to do that. <coughs> But there are times that the gift that he gives is not necessarily the miracle. The gift that he oftentimes gives is the words, I see you, daughter. The gift that he gives us is that reminder. He says, I see you, son. I see you struggling faithfully, son. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. You are my own. The second challenge for those of you um, maybe who are not going through a season of difficulty would be to take a cue from, from Jesus. I want to read one more verse. This is a verse we've already read, but I want to highlight something unique in it. Um, this is in verse 47. It says, Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. I just want to emphasize again, seeing that she could not go unnoticed. What we see in Jesus' life is he's consistently looking for those who are otherwise going unnoticed, and he's taking the time to actually speak life and encouragement and love in them. Oftentimes, miraculously healing them. And, and the challenge that I have for us is, if you're in a season where everything is just up and to the right, like it's a good season, my challenge and my encouragement for you is start looking for people who otherwise are getting unnoticed, who are in pain and they're they're unnoticed because, guess what? It's easy to come into a space like this and you sing some songs and you shake some hands and you hear a message and then it's like, hey, lunchtime. Hey, got to get to that to-do list. And we roll out of here. 
And so my encouragement and my challenge is, how about instead of just kind of rolling out, that maybe you take the time not to work the crowd, right? Hey, weather is crazy these days. Yeah, we're just going to get cold again. Don't work the crowd, but actually stop and listen to the stories in the crowd. And maybe not even just here, maybe out in the community, maybe at your workplace. Instead of just focusing on your to-do list and focus on your tasks, actually listen. And when there is opportunity to speak a word of encouragement, Notice those who would otherwise go unnoticed with a word of encouragement. That you would, you would actually pray for people. It may not even be Christians, but you just say, hey, can I pray for you right now? People who would otherwise be unnoticed. Here, here's another, like, just next level challenge here. Maybe as you listen to the stories around you, you would actually potentially become the answer to someone's desperate situation in prayer. That you actually become the answer to their, God, are you out there? God, are you, are you going to be able to be able to rescue me from this situation? But as you're listening and as you're noticing people, yeah, I can meet that need in Jesus' name. Can we become a church? Can we become Christians? Can we become individuals like Jesus who don't let people go unnoticed? That's my prayer. Let's pray. God, I know that there are some today who are here and they've been in a 12-plus year marathon struggle. And so, Father, I do, I pray for the miracle in their life. Father, as we seek collectively as a church, you, I, I pray that you would, that you would bring um, healing in whatever, whatever area of their life that they need healing. Father, I, I pray that in this moment, that even through your Holy Spirit, that you would, you would speak that, those words that would mean so much to them, if it's the word son, if it's the word daughter, I pray that you would speak that into their heart. And Father, if it's not, um, if it's not going to come from that still small voice from you, Father, I pray that we would at least be a church, a church that would speak that encouragement over them, that we would be a, a church that would recognize the need and we would meet the need. I pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.